All right. Um, hello, I'm Dushin Dasher and I'm a faculty at School of Environment and Architecture. Uh, we start with the fourth conversation, which is uh, thinking through material ecologies. Um, by the way, I do need coffee, but uh, please bear with uh, the next one. Uh, I would um, introduce uh, Zuzana Gombazova. Uh, she's a material researcher and a designer. And her interests, uh, you know, lie in um, uh, some things that we probably don't see. I mean, uh, she works with uh, flesh. She works with, um, her interests are also in um, uh, biology, uh, uh, bacterial cellulose, you know, all these interesting uh, things. She's, she's a designer uh, and her background is in textiles and fashion. She's, she's worked in uh, many uh, uh, places across the world, in Istanbul, in London, and in Mumbai. Um, and her, uh, she has a design studio now, uh, based out of Kochi. Uh, she has invented a new material uh, called uh, Malai. And her, her uh, uh, firm itself is called uh, Malai Biomaterials Design. Um, by this introduction, I'll just invite uh, Zuzana to come up to the stage. Thank you, Dushan, for such a thorough introduction. I'm sure after mentioning flesh and bacteria, everybody's thrilled. But don't worry, you're safe. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, thinking through material ecologies, as you, as you rightly put it, which I do mostly through, my, uh, through the practice that I co-founded called Malai. But first of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself or a little bit of a CV. Um, so here is my trajectory. Uh, thank you, Google Maps. And um, I will use this pointer. So this is where I come from. It's called Slovakia. Uh, I was born there and brought up there. And uh, at the age of 18, I left the Czech Republic to study fashion and textile design. <laughs> Later, I studied the uh, same field in uh, Turkey, in the city of Istanbul. Uh, I did my master's degree in London at a course called MA Material Futures, which is a design research-led course, uh, mostly pondering and dealing with materiality, context of material materiality and invention of new materials. And uh, around five years ago, um, a job offer brought me to India and I was working in Mumbai for one year and um, uh, for the past two and a half years I've been in Kochi in Kerala uh, where my practice is. Um, so I'll begin with the place where I come from again. Uh, I come from a small village in a country called Slovakia in Central Europe and the population is um, 1,843, I don't know if many of you can imagine <laughs> what does it mean to come from a place like that. It's not many people, a lot of space. Um, we, and for me, the most interesting architectural spaces, perhaps, in the given environment are wine cellars. Um, because um, this is a very old tradition that happens in the area where I come from. We make wine, all sorts of, you know, different grapes. Uh, but also, it is a small-scale lab where biological processes happen throughout the year, uh, where fermentation happens and gives us beautiful fruits, such as wine. This is my father and um, one of our neighbors um, after or in between of debating life matters. Um, and... As I mentioned before, my specialization is actually not architecture. I have trained as fashion and textile design. And as such, my interaction with material was perhaps much more direct, you know, from the very beginning. Because as apparel designers, as textile designers, we interact with materiality um, firsthand, you know. We have textiles, we have yarns, we explore how the fabrics wrap around body. And, you know, initially, it is more about uh, forms of self-expression for somebody. It is more about exploring what kind of communication can fashion offer us. Um, but it is also a starting point from, for, for what I do now. And that's um, why I find it quite important. Uh, 
And for me, perhaps a kind of place of revelation or a place of transformation was Istanbul itself. Um, Istanbul is, you know, a metropolitan city of more than 24 million people and the center of textile, both textile and fashion industry. Um, and maybe also a place where you can see material created on very different scales. You can see uh, Turkey and Istanbul as a place where tradition of textile making is rooted and perhaps is one of the oldest on our planet. Uh, and you can also see Istanbul and Turkey as a modern city where, uh, you know, modern industries turning meters and meters and meters of, of textiles and producing uh, garments um, are created. Um, and for me, it was there when I realized, okay, you know, material, um, I can consider material and its, and its meaning um, in, depending on different scale and each scale has a very different impact. Um, and in fact, you know, the whole human history has been driven by our interaction with materials. That's how we call the historical periods. Oh, sorry. Uh, whether it was our interaction with stone, with iron, with bronze, and uh, perhaps nowadays we are at the stage where we interact mostly with waste because that's what we are kind of left with <laughs> at this point. Um, and you can also see a kind of turn in, in the society where suddenly waste has become a center of attention and has become a point where we can draw from and we can, you know, learn from. Um, so when we think about materials, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of connections for us. You know, materials have a connection with health. When you think of materials, we think about different values. We think about different sensorial experiences. We think in terms of performance. We think in terms of culture. We think in terms of connection with environment, we think in terms of expression of beauty, and also nowadays in terms of creation of waste and use of waste. Mm. So, you know, it is interesting to see that uh, we actually give such a little importance to, to the world of materials. I mean, maybe not all of you, but many people do. We don't always notice what things are made of, what impact do they have, who made them. Uh, and I would like to talk a little bit about what I do, uh, which is, you know, creating new materials. This field is perhaps not new. People have been inventing materials through centuries. Um, but how do new materials emerge? Um, I see it, or I can describe it in maybe three different approaches. There is a targeted research, which is um, mostly uh, wrapped in the realm of science. Uh, there is um, an approach of exploring possibilities of given resources, which is maybe what uh, we can see in the realm of craft, design, engineering as well. And then there's a third one, which is kind of more random approach uh, of material explorations, which we see very often in art and also design. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of uh, how I see these approaches. Uh, science approach. This is a typical scientist um, inventing <laughs> new material. Uh, I don't know why Google um, has this particular picture, but why not? Um, so what is, what is a science approach to inventing, to invention of new materials? A scientist or a group of scientists uh, generally would um, receive a brief, uh, which would ask them to explore certain material properties or perfect certain material properties of a material, or to invent the material that performs in certain way. They would then identify fields of study within the material science, because there are many of them. Uh, they would conduct targeted studies uh, and experiments, do the material testing, draw their conclusions, do the refinement of the experiments, then probably do another set of testing, maybe publish a paper, and then, if everything is successful, they can then um, uh, start the path of scaling together with engineers and investors and a lot of other people. So this is an example of how um, a type of glass was invented by 
a group of scientists from Australia that can block UV rays um, uh, using vanadium oxide phases. I will not talk about it in detail. Um, another approach, uh, which is also close to what I do, is exploring possibilities of given resources. This is something that has been you know, recurring in history. And I'm giving you one example, which is quite recent, by a designer called Sine Kim, which has been using urine. You know, we don't often think about our own body as a material because it is difficult to detach ourselves from the idea of, you know, our self. Uh, but our bodies too is a material. And if you have a lot of people living in one place, you can consider that a pool of materials you can use, uh, such as urine. So Sine has um, invented the process of using urine as a material to create glazed tiles. I think she's using a process of distillation, uh, which leaves her with solid particles. She can then apply on the tiles uh, using a firing processes. She can get different colors and different textures on the tiles. So why not? Um, another approach, which is also exploring given um, material resources is a project I worked on approximately five years ago. Here in India, I worked for a large manufacturer um, on a project researching industrial waste that comes from the factories. So here we see turning and boring waste, uh, which comes from the process of turning and boring, creating different you know, mechanical components uh, and so on. And particularly problematic is a scenario of aluminium turning and boring, for example. Uh, because these particles of metals are very small. So if you want to remelt them, it's basically impossible because they oxidize before they even you know, manage to melt and be recreated into, into a piece of material. Uh, they are also difficult to manipulate with because they are small. They can, you can inhale them, you, know, you can get cuts very easily. Um, so in terms of waste management, not much is being done with them. Most of them are actually just being incinerated. Uh, so we were looking at the different processes of, you know, how can we reuse this material? How can we give it a new life, prolong its life? How can we give it um, an application that, that is still valid? Uh, and we came up with a process of heat pressing, uh, which doesn't require temperatures high enough to melt the material but compact it into a disc uh, of material that can be then uh, you know, polished, it can be sanded, it can be turned into an interesting material. Maybe it won't have a load-bearing uh, properties, but you can still use it for many things. And on top of that, after that stage of life, if you decide to recycle it, you can do that because it's already compacted into um, a form of material that you can remelt. Uh, another approach that I would like to talk about is material exploration, which is perhaps a point um, or starting point of work for many designers, maybe students here. I heard you have, have a course on, on material explorations and work with materials. So maybe that's an approach you would be more familiar with. Uh, this is an example of work of my peer, Sophie Rowley. She's a German slash Kiwi designer, and her approach to work with materials is very intuitive. She's mostly looking into, you know, expressing um, uh, or looking for new aesthetics in materials, imitating certain natural states or natural materials. She doesn't really, you know, select materials to, 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 to start working with. She's looking for a certain aesthetic. She works with glass, she works with foams, she works with metals, and she, her, her kind of objective is to recreate a certain aesthetic. Uh, where does her work end up, if you're asking? It were, uh, she, for example, this is a, a series of material samples called Water, State of Matter. She has developed for an architectural studio, for a special commission. Um, another 
material exploration that maybe has was initiated in a kind of random beginning is Sugru. I don't know if any of you is, uh, are familiar with this type of material. Are you? It hasn't reached here, maybe. So Sugru is a um, um, kind of a polymer invented by Irish designer whose name I cannot pronounce because it's Celtic, but you can look it up. Um, she invented this material very randomly. She was playing with sawdust and silicone, trying to find a way how to fix things. She was a product designer um, and she was simply fed up with you know, bringing on more and more products into the world because she thought, okay, we already have enough, so why not inventing a way how to fix things? So without having you know, the, the, the technical education or, or the background in science, simply by interaction with the material, with different ingredients, she somehow miraculously uh, landed at Sugru. Uh, she's been perfecting the recipe of the material for, I think, over five years. And her enterprise became quite successful. Uh, I think recently, a German company, Tessa, um, bought her company. And uh, it seems like they're going to start manufacturing Sugru on a, uh, on a mass scale. Uh, so now, how does Malai function or how does my practice function in, in, in context of you know, bringing in new materials or inventing new materials. Um, our process at Malai also started with material explorations. Uh, later on, we got to the stage of exploring possibilities of available resources. And now we are at the stage when we do targeted research. And I'll explain further how it works. Um, I started the project uh, approximately in 2013. Uh, it was still during my master's studies, uh, when I was trying to look at ways of manufacturing um, that would be completely different from the ways we are used to seeing you know, products and materials coming into the world. I was looking for systems that are not necessarily you know, conventional, such as you have a, a tree, you cut the tree, you take a piece of wood, you make an object. I was looking at something different and that brought me to the realm of microbiology. Uh, and I started studying the field. It took me around one year to go through some initial literature. Uh, and I was particularly interested in the types of microorganisms that are able to perform certain changes that are transformative, that uh, can disassemble matter, that can assemble matter together that can act as information storages. You know, there is a huge potential in the area of microbiology for the future of design, for the future of, of manufacturing itself. And uh, it is said, or I guess it is said, that we have researched more about the outer space, that we have researched about the, the realm of microbiome on our world. In fact, we, we probably know less than 0.01 percentage of microorganisms that are you know, present on the surface of the earth and inside the ocean. I guess it's difficult to prove because we haven't invented, I mean, we haven't really uh, found out what they are, but you can probably see the potential that lies in the field. Uh, and my research brought me further to a particular microorganism called Acetobacter xylinum. Now, this is a type of bacteria that feeds on carbohydrates. They can come from different sources. Uh, and it also needs the presence of an acidic component, which is generally acetic acid. And it is able to produce the purest form of cellulose on Earth, so-called bacterial or microbial cellulose. Uh, now, my research was very you know, hands-on. I started in a lab with an expert in microbiology who introduced me to the basic methodologies of you know, uh, a culture inoculation, of cultivating bacteria, of growing this material. And I couldn't really rely on the literature from the design field because there was no literature you know, on, on how to craft with bacteria. It was simply not there. Um, 
And that's why I started researching mostly publications from the realm of science. Uh, and I was interested in how can we work with material of this group, with materials of this group, because your tools obviously are very different. You don't have a chisel, you don't have a knife, you know, to cut into. You have an incubator and, you know, you have your feeding abilities and your material can die at any given time if, if you contaminate it. Uh, so it's been quite a journey. And uh, over the time, I, I identified uh, methods of growing this material and controlling the growth of this material that gave me certain results. Let's say I was able to control the thickness of the grown material or uh, some basic types of shapes of material. Um, or I was able to grow um, sort of a relief. So that was already a huge progress. I know it doesn't sound very <laughs> groundbreaking, but working with living organisms is, is very challenging. Uh, and as a result you know, of my, of, of my uh, research during the MA studies, I came up with a concept of a machine that is able to control the growth patterns of such a material. I called my project an invisible resources because that's how I envision all the you know, realm of microorganisms that for me have a potential to transform uh, this field. Uh, and then for a year, you know, I, I had a good opportunity to exhibit um, my work, to talk to different experts from the field and outside the field. And everybody kept telling me, ah, oh, this is very interesting. And that's where it you know, kind of ended. I didn't know how to find myself. I didn't know how to scale up. Like I had basically no idea, but, Life brought me to India, uh, where um, I remembered from my research that bacterial cellulose um, can be grown on water from coconuts, from major coconuts. And this is actually a practice that's been, that's been there in the Philippines for over 100 years. There is actually a cottage industry already uh, you know, working there. Um, but in the Philippines, um, this material is called nata de coco. I don't know, maybe some of you are familiar with it from the food industry. Um, it's generally cut in small cubes and put in a, a sugary syrup and it's eaten as a dessert. It's very popular in, I guess, some of the South e Asian states, um, especially in Japan. And I thought, you know, maybe it would be interesting to explore this possibility of growing nata de coco or bacterial cellulose here in India because you guys have so many coconuts here. Um, so I started, you know, looking for possibilities of, of, you know, growing it. And meanwhile, I met uh, my business partner, Susmit, who is from Kerala, so-called the land of coconuts, if you didn't know. Um, and together we contacted a um, coconut processing unit here in South India. And uh, we started collaborating with them. Uh, we started collecting their with the water. Actually, the water from brown coconuts, it's not used. It's not the same as the uh, water from green coconuts that is so popular to drink. The water from brown coconuts is generally discarded and it actually acidifies soils in most of the cases. Uh, so we started collecting it. Uh, we fed it to bacterial cultures and we grew sheets of bacterial cellulose, which is essentially this material. This is how it looks like when you harvest it. The whole process takes around uh, 12 to 14 days. So if you think about it in comparison with other sources of cellulose, let's say uh, a tree, it's actually much, much shorter process because you're able to get pure form of cellulose in the stretch of 14 days. Uh, and once we establish this, this you know, uh, initial uh, supply chain for the raw material, we started um, experimenting with bacterial cellulose further. We were looking for ways how to stabilize this material, how to make it into material that we can use for you know, products so that it doesn't stay just in the realm of experimentation. We were looking for ways how to do it. And at that time, we started experimenting with natural fibers. Uh, I don't know if many of you know that you can get a very good quality fiber from banana stems. Okay. So you can, <laughs> um, and banana stems are also kind of agricultural waste here because 
most of the people after harvesting bananas cut down the tree and you know throw out the stem mm. uh, and we also introduced uh, hemp fibers and sea cell fibers to the material and we kept ourselves a kind of a challenge you know we wanted to bring a material wanted to we wanted to invent the material or or come up with a recipe for material that doesn't use anything oil-based because the point of our intervention and our you know inquiry with the materials was that we wanted to create materials that are healthy that are not burden for the environment at any stage you know not at the manufacturing stage not during the use stage and not after the disposal uh, so this condition was kind of crucial for us and made our work incredibly difficult in many ways because if you look at the materials of today many of them contain something plastic you know it doesn't necessarily have to be plastic itself it can be a coating it can be a tiny bit of an ingredient that is derived from oil so our research in that measure had to go back you know we had to go back to the traditional knowledge to the types of materials that were used before the era of plastics and that's a very rich area that you can draw research from uh, and we started in the kitchen you know um, i think i always compare a kitchen to be a small you know small scale lab because you can do most of the basic processes there uh, it's a kind of, you know, basic chemistry. You're putting things together. You're applying different um, conditions to it, such as heat, pressure. Uh, it took us around seven months to come up with a, with something basic, with a basic recipe for a material that we thought has the potential to go further. At that point, the material you know, we, we, we were not looking for, let's say, alternative for leather. We were looking for a material we can use for something. Initially, we thought the area of packaging might be interesting, uh, but gradually we came to, to make material that somehow resembled leather. And then we started scaling up our process, which was another challenge. So you can see in 2017, we had these tiny little 10 by 10 centimeter samples. In one year, we got to a stage where we were able to make sheets of material um, that were approximately one meter to one meter big or large. Um, this is a small diagram of a process. If, if you look at it and you don't understand certain points, that's okay because our patent is pending, so <laughs> we don't want to reveal them. But as you can see, everything starts with a coconut. Just for a comparison or for your reference, a small coconut processing unit disposes of more than 4,000 liters of coconut water per day, which is actually quite a lot. Uh, and from that amount, we are able to make 320 square meters of our finished material. Um, so I already, I guess, explained the process a little bit. It all starts with the fermentation, where you introduce bacterial culture to the coconut water, you give it 12 days. After 12 days, you can harvest a wet sheet of material. Then we prepare our fibers from uh, sea cell, hemp and banana. And we can either form uh, the, the material into three-dimensional shape, which further eliminates uh, you know, offcuts or waste, or we can form them into, in, in, into sheets. Um, so as I said, now we are at the stage of targeted research. What does it mean? We have a basic recipe, a basic formulation for the material. And at the moment, we can use it for uh, fashion accessories. Why fashion accessories? You know, fashion is a type of industry that accepts change quite well. It is a type of industry where products turn quite fast. Uh, and it actually needs materials that are sustainable for products. Um, that we don't keep for such a long time. Uh, we can make light footwear or certain types of interior products. Uh, now, to give you an example of what does it mean or what's, what's the process of invention of material, it's actually quite similar to any other design process. So, <laughs> you begin here and you go through a lot of literature you have to have a solid research question, otherwise you get lost somewhere. Um, and you start doing your initial experiments and you're like, okay, this is working, I'm getting somewhere. 
then you come up with something you really like and it's working for something, you think you're a genius and this is great, this is going to make a history. And at some point you hit the bottom because you cannot go any further, you cannot improve. Obviously, you know, uh, you have limitations within your own practice and this is why you, when you need help of people from other fields, inventing a material is not one man show. It is work of people from many different fields. Without that, it's impossible. Uh, so, you know, in terms of improving material properties, you need help from people who understand material on molecular level generally, such as uh, material scientists, material engineers, uh, chemical engineers. If you want to make your material in bigger scale, you need help of engineers because you need to mechanize most of your processes and you need funding, of course. And then maybe, maybe you have success, who knows? We initially thought that, you know, we would be having a material in stretch of two years, how naive. Now I think it will be another 10 years. <laughs> who knows? Um, so what actually determines, you know, if new material stays or not? There are many factors and some of them you can influence, some of them you cannot. You have to have, of course, availability of resources. Without that, it's impossible. Your material and the manufacturing process has to be scalable. Uh, your material has to have a good performance because if your material doesn't perform, you know, up to a certain mark, you cannot use it and nobody will adopt it. Your material should also have a cultural reference. So, for example, you know, if you are using human blood to produce plastics, many people might not be <laughs> okay with that. Hence, the cultural relevance comes into picture. You have to have funding, you have to have funding all the time, and your market also has to be ready. Um, so, as you can see, it's many different fields working together. So, where are we now? Just to give you an example of, you know, what the material actually is and how it looks like. Um, this is a collection of accessories that we have recently a design and made for the occasion of crowdfunding campaign, the funding, you know. Um, and, you know, crowdfunding campaign for us was not only a good way to, to collect money that we needed for mechanization, let's say, but this was also the first time we are releasing products from this material to the world, to the people who can use them directly. So it's a good way for us to get the direct feedback because working with other companies and working with you know, other brands, um, trying to present them a new material, trying to tell them, okay, this is something new and you know, it's better what you're using now, you should adopt it. That's not a very straightforward process. It takes time because everybody needs to test the material. If you're talking with, let's say, um, sneaker manufacturers, you know, which everybody who sees us, you know, and talks to us is like, you should talk to Nike and Adidas. And like, yeah, well, you know, it's not like you talk to them and they're like, okay, let's start doing it. It's not like that. <laughs> they get the samples of the material, you know, they test it first. They tell you what is okay, what is not up to mark. You have to go back to your lab, back to your collaborations, maybe improve your material. Then they do another set of testing. Then they make one pair of sneakers. Then they have the 50 pairs made and have it tested on the first batch of you know, people who wear them for a certain time. And this process repeats until uh, at least one side, in this case, probably a sneaker manufacturer is happy. Um, yeah, these are also some of the products. So that's where we are. Um, you know, maybe if somebody would ask me if I would do this again, I would say definitely not, because it's <laughs> far more challenging than I ever imagined. Um, but I believe when we are in the times when we need materials that are different, we need to think about materials that surround us, that we interact with on a day-to-day basis, because the whole system of material manufacturing has become too far too complex. We don't see into things. You know, we don't know where things come from, who made them, what impact do they have, not only on the industries, on people who made them, on us. Everything is connected, everything is circular. And that's why I believe, you know, Malai is not like going to save the world. We need 
500 projects, probably like Manai, you know, who, who believe that there is a necessity to change the material culture, and maybe then we can have an impact. Thank you. Uh, to your uh, surprises, yes, this is still an architectural forum, uh, uh, but it's but it's uh, but it's interesting that you know we are opening up this uh, this kind of a topic in an architectural forum. Um, we are not talking about steel. We are not, not talking about wood or concrete or you know a certain kind of uh, use of a certain materials. And, but we are rather uh, actively involved in uh, designing materials and not designing objects. You know, I mean the the most traditional uh, approach that architects or designers generally have is to is to jump on and kind of make a product or make an object, you know, for human. But but I think I think her practice, what what she brings in from her uh, experiments and experiences, is you know she designs materials. I mean, uh, although we see it right now in a form of a object, but I'm definitely sure it has many more uh, possibilities. So so opening, I mean, uh, I have three uh, points. Maybe if we can cover all of them. So, so there is a there's a big difference between operating with tools and operating with an apparatus. I think in in this case, we, when we saw um, uh, tools kind of leaving the, the the picture of design, I mean the new uh, uh, new uh, professions, new interests, new uh, specialists uh, uh, came into the picture. You know, the process completely. Sort of change the workflow was uh, completely different than how we imagine a space, you know, and 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 I think that that also uh, shapes a new kind of a practice, you know. It also shapes a new way of uh, making things. It shapes also a new way of doing things, and it shapes a uh, new forms, you know, because uh, the moment you change uh, material at a micro at a molecular level, it also has multiple impacts on form that it produces. So I, I'll just say, elaborate on these experiences that you have from uh, shaping a new practice that you have right now. Um, yeah, it's, you know, in a way, this has been a, a great process of learning for me. And uh, I think whenever you get a chance or whenever I get the chance to work on a project which involves perspective of experts from different fields, it is enriching for all uh, of us involved. Um, and it is a process where you naturally do a lot of mistakes because there are no given standards, no given, you know, methods that you should follow. So um, in a way, it's a lot about trial and error, you know, where you have perhaps the scientist there uh, acting as a sort of person of guidance, even though even scientists, like sometimes they just don't know, you know, <laughs> but um, um, yeah, sorry. What was your question? <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, do you see that? Uh, how do you see uh, material futures? I mean, your, your course, I mean, I, I would just like to then uh, bring in your academic experience. Um, it's it's somewhere in between. It's it's uh, it's not uh, design. I mean, it's it's an art school, right? I mean, it's um, and you define many uh, uh, terms uh, like designer in the Suguru project, uh, recipe, uh, uh, body as material, um, the I mean cultivation. I mean, as humans, we are cultivating food for us, but now in cases like this we are cultivating new materials okay we are not growing them we don't have our associations set up with uh, things with that we find around and we kind of immediately take and make something so what does this you know sort of change now with with um, uh, our associations to materials and in turn like for example your um, uh, example of uh, body as material and if we if we if you take that uh, 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 idea how does it change our relationship to other materials or does do we see them differently or do we see ourselves differently you know so so where does this kind of question of uh, the new you know lie in this i think the new doesn't necessarily always lie within you know um, 
newly generated, let's say, materials that are highly scientific. Sometimes it's about giving a new perspective on the material, putting the material in a new context that was not there before. Uh, like in terms of, let's say, grown materials, you know, a lot of um, methodology that I, for example, had to draw from was uh, farming, you know, and uh, a lot of questions that arise during my initial research, uh, still during the studies was, you know, how do you approach that and what kind of skill set do you need? And, you know, um, when you're making a product out of, uh, again, some maybe some more conventional material, um, there is a certain process you can follow. And generally, you know, you know the outcome. Uh, when you're working with something like living organisms, you have to have a lot of patience. And still there are factors that you cannot influence, you know, because... We simply don't know that much about uh, how certain microorganisms, for example, will react to certain environments. It is still like being researched. Um, uh, and a lot of it is also intuitive, I guess. It, I mean, and the other thing that you also, I mean, stressed upon, especially the, the context of waste. Uh, when we are reading materials, when we are actually fundamentally changing materials, um, does it change the context? I mean, does the context arrive from this experiment or does it come from a resource base that you have established as, as waste? I mean, uh, and is it the kind of future that you, that you foresee that is it only waste or there are many other contexts that, uh, that open up through these kind of experiments, material contexts? I think, yes, there are many different contexts that can open up, you know. Um, I feel like we just got to the point where we started looking at the waste as a resource, you know. And uh, again, in, in uh, many countries here, you know, there is already like a very strong informal economy that works, you know, on recycling and, and reinventing material on, on certain level. Um, so I guess... If, you know, from certain perspective, it is kind of a trend that's going on right now as well. Um, yeah. And um, I'd like to also bring in um, uh, the digital over here because I think your whole process is uh, is quite hands-on. You know, it's quite manual. You're you're still having a a an, an human involvement in it or body involvement in it, uh, but are increasingly um, uh, digital lives, you know, kind of uh, have changed our body as well. Like, you know, we are present in multiple spaces at the same time. So, so we have changed our definitions of what a body is today. I mean, so it's, you know, we are in fragments everywhere. Now, what is, now, what is that context and how does sort of materiality uh, come into this uh, context? How does it factor in? Like, how do you see that? Do you see that as a new context or, or do you think that there are possibilities within this context? Of the, yeah. of the materials in the digital realm. Mm. Mm. Yes, I think, you know, it's hard to say because obviously digital realm um, is digital. We don't often think about it uh, as a material, even though, you know, what we interact with digitally is made from materials as well. Um, but perhaps, you know, what, how, how we perceive the digital realm with like virtual realities and everything could alter our relationship to materials. But I think, uh, our interaction with the materials as they are, that's something that perhaps we evolved with. That's something that humanity has evolved with for thousands of years. So I think it would be very, very difficult for us to disregard it. Perhaps it also, you know, there are some studies that says that, um, you know, when you have a child, for example, the first thing it starts doing is playing with the materials, you know, getting a tactile in experience from the interaction with the material and that helps development of the brain itself. So I don't think we can like completely remove that and say, you know, it's all going to be replaced by digital or maybe it will be one day, but I really don't know what impact will it have on, on you know, our brains and the way we perceive our world around us that it's difficult for me to say because I'm also not an expert in the digital realm. I mean, I, I think it it opened up many uh, questions, at least for 
for me to uh, to look at as material associations because I think that's something that you um, you mentioned in the start of your presentations. Um, our material, I mean, our material associations are built through uh, the tactile uh, tactile uh, association that you just mentioned, but you have a completely new material now. Like for example, in this case, it might it is replacing actually leather or it is replacing a sheet material in a sense like it's you know it's completely made new but in a form of a sheet material how does this new material when it enters into into our ecology into our material ecology what what does it change is it kind of is it generating a new uh, material culture or can it take another form and and influence uh, material cultures i mean that's that's another thing that was kind of interesting for me to to sort of think about it actually mm. I hope it will influence our material culture uh, on some level. Mm. So our idea is to, um, you know, to use the material for kind of appropriate application. So when we put the, our material in the context of fashion and um, objects or products made, you know, uh, within the realm of fashion, such as accessories, uh, we try to. Also bear in mind um, the times that we live in, you know, uh, if you look at the leather materials and uh, leather products, uh, maybe in the older days, they would be kind of hereditary, you know, and you could, uh, a leather product would last you for many, many years, maybe generations, even if you took proper care of it. But I think we no longer really live in such times. Uh, maybe some of us still practice that, but I think most of the people don't, and uh, the fashion industry also doesn't really support that that kind of view. Uh, and also, there are other factors. You know, you might buy, let's say, a bag made of leather, and then one day you gift it to somebody else with the good intentions, but the person doesn't like it. So it eventually ends up maybe in a landfill, anyways. You know, there are many many factors you cannot predict. So at the very least, I think we can do is to use a material that is not a burden at that point of time of its life. So, okay, uh, I think uh, uh, this is a good discussion. We can open it up uh, to the audience for questions. Hello, yes. Uh, I, have a, I have a devil's advocate type question, which is um, why is it important for, uh, in the context you're working in, uh, which could either be maybe a pedagogical context or a context of industry like the fashion industry. Why is it important for people to know where materials come from and how they're made? Because from what I can see, both in architecture, even in a consumer market in India, uh, it's now something that's marketable to say that to uh, for products and brands to say, you know, oh, well, this comes from, this comes from here. It's made out of this. And this is why it's, Obviously, uh, this is often attached to ideologies of sustainability and so on. But I think you can see that in many consumer products now. So um, maybe a kind of alternative example uh, where you see this, this, this kind of question of demystifying materials or expecting that their kind of presence will um, make something happen in terms of a kind of consciousness would also be an Anuradha's lecture where she showed the image of the um, the the mud plastered house that the Norwegian organization built. Because in that context, the uh, the house was also meant as a kind of material demonstration. But its demonstration, this kind of, uh, in a sense, the demystification was also about getting people to build for themselves, which is related to an ideology of of self help uh, work which has its own history. So I was kind of interested in thinking of that example that she showed to come back to the context you're operating in. Um, why is it, why is it good for people to understand uh, where things come from, how they're made to kind of unpack that? I think it's um, in some way a matter of like basic literacy about, you know, things around us understanding the value of the things, because often uh, 
you know, with the things, especially things that are mass manufacturers, uh, you know, their price comes down very, very much. And often people choose to go for products made with something cheap, which is not necessarily something that is better, you know, but you don't understand what's behind it. So I think, yeah, it's a matter of basic literacy to know what things are, what they are made of, where they came from. Maybe not about everything. Maybe there are, you know, uh, basic knowledge. I'm not saying everybody should know, you know, to the exact detail. Uh, obviously, that's interesting only for people like me or, you know, people from the field. But um, I think we, we in our material culture, we are quite detached from, from understanding how basic manufacturing processing work, work as a general public. So uh, I just had a, I think your presentation was very lovely and simple. And I think I, I'm just wondering if the process is, I mean, though you may have experimented for long um, years on this, I'm just wondering, and probably will partly answer uh, a question that he has raised, that can this be now material be going back to the kitchen to be able to make this material, not just at your factory or your place, but it becomes a part of every little space and where it becomes a part of, you know, everybody trying to make it or everybody can make it. And it's, it's just kind of not centralized into this whole known industrial process. So that's, that's one question that comes to my mind. The other question that comes to my mind is that while the whole debate on development and all these things that are happening around, there are these ideas, new ideas that one is talking about are like circular economies and therefore products which are also you know, uh, cradle to cradle kind of an idea. It's, it's still an old idea, but nonetheless, the idea of the material kind of not getting downgraded as it gets recycled, but kind of becomes something else every time that it kind of changes its form. And I think to some extent, that's the kind of question uh, he was trying uh, alluding to. So there are some questions which I think I, could be very interesting that if you, and the third question that actually I have for you, for you is, did you then finally experiment for what are the, I mean, maybe it's the industrial process again, but did you figure out what is its inside strength? What is it that it can do? What is it that it cannot do? You know, so that it kind of, you can also expand then the realm of where this material application can occur. Uh, yeah, so to answer your first question, um, we don't actually have like a big factory. <laughs> uh, our material is uh, still at the stage where it's sort of semi handmade actually. Uh, and we don't think of perhaps the future of its manufacturing in terms of big factories, but sort of a decentralized system, you know, where you can have units that can make this uh, product everywhere where the raw materials are. And there is a, you know, there's a process that leads to it because then you have to know the ways to to um, provide certain standard, right? So that you don't end up with every sheet of material being completely different. So there's a lot of work to, to reach that stage from our perspective. And many people also ask us, you know, oh, can it be made from something else than coconuts, you know, because then how do you, how do you make it local for different geographies? And, uh, it is possible to make it local in different environments as well because you can grow bacterial cellulose uh, on many different sources. But it is uh, the process that, you know, uses the coconut water that is the best research maybe up to date. And there is an av availability of that raw material as a feed for the bacteria, which is an advantage at the early stages of development of this material. But, you know, this could be grown on waste from apples, let's say, uh, we could use different mixture of fibers that not necessarily produce the same material, but the material of the same group. So there are possibilities like that. But again, we are looking at the stretch of many years. Yeah. Uh, one last question. Yeah. There is a big possibility of democratizing this whole process. And what you're saying is that this idea can actually fly and you know it, so i think that's that's the beauty of probably the, what you're doing that it kind of the operation is not uh, very okay uh, there's a question here one last question that we have 
what is the employment uh, potential of this material uh, excuse me the potential of this material to create jobs and employment okay <laughs> <laughs> i feel like being at a pitch session now but okay <laughs> and i forgot to answer your questions i'm sorry uh regarding the material testing we are doing that every couple of months to see what progress and if we did any progress. So we were at the stage of a low <laughs> already. And now we're working with um, uh, IIT Hyderabad in order to target certain properties such as tensile strength and abrasion resistance so that we can improve that and start using the material not only for you know fashion accessories, which is a use that perhaps doesn't require so uh, such a high... I don't want to say functionality, but you know, it is. It, it gives you bigger flexibility. But we would like to start using material also for uh, things like footwear, for maybe upholstery. But for all that, it needs further development. So, which indirectly, I guess, answers also your question: What's the potential? Or oh, for the jobs? Sorry. Um, so. In terms of jobs, uh, we are trying to work towards creating. Um, supply system that works uh, directly with copra drying societies i don't know if you're familiar with them they are copra is a product um we have the white flesh of coconut that is dry so especially in south india in places like kerala there are societies that produce this type of product and again they are the ones that discard the water they don't use it so for them it would be an additional uh income basically because we would buy the material from them in terms of creating jobs, we are already training people, you know, for a new skill for mal malai making or material making. Quantity to number of people. So that depends a little on the mechanization, level of mechanization. You know, at the moment, for example, we need more people because we don't have uh, that many specialized machines yet. We need to develop that as the material is also new. Uh, with further steps of mechanization, we can have, you know, I don't want to say less people, we would still need people, but uh, they would have to have certain, you know, better skill or let's say more experience with the material. But a lot of material is processed in the, in the process of this, right? So, okay, so we uh, end our session uh, here. Uh, we did the last session. I had a oh, there's one more. I uh, am Vijayashree. Uh, and I have a very simple question, uh, kind of a curiosity. Uh, how do you uh, decompose this material? Is it like uh, how many days it takes? Because if we are thinking of uh, mass production of uh, or uh, usability of the same uh, at a larger scale or maybe in building uh, industry, uh, how does it happen? Like, uh, Are you able to reuse it again or is it is it? It can be decomposed and is it like a compost which you can use or how is it like? We saw the half uh, life cycle of it. I want to know the rest. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are both ways or oh, two things you can do with the material when you don't want to use it any longer for whatever reason. Mm, you can either recycle it into paper materials because it's essentially cellulose, cellulose fiber, which is what constitutes paper. Uh, or uh, you can shred it into smaller pieces and put it in your home compost where it decomposes in three to five months depending on the climate. All right, uh, we end the session and we invite... There's a, there's, a, there's a tea break now, tea and coffee break, finally. 15 minutes, we come back uh, at 5.10.